This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I'm personally honored that you're willing to speak to me on a Saturday night when you probably have a million better things to do than to deal with me. Um, I'm excited to speak with you for a number of reasons. Not only do I respect your written word and your regular appearances on TV in particular, and even just your social media output, um, I, think, I think I'm lucky that I met you when the protests were first starting, I think it was days or maybe even the first week, I was walking down Sheraj Meze and I see two guests from the podcast, Mark Dao or Hossam Aid, Urbanista and, and Mark Dao, all that is Mark Dao. And then I see you and we had a bit of a chat and I knew who you were. I, I was embarrassed to sort of try to speak with you too much at that moment. I think you were walking to the protests and I was walking away. But I always thought you're somebody that I would love to speak with. And then sort of time passed, everything that happened, happened, the good and the bad, all the momentum, all the pain, everything that could go wrong went wrong. And there were some battles that were won too. And then I saw your name appear once again. It was in a recent Politics Today piece that we're going to jump into. And you referenced something that, that I think resonates more and more as time passes, the Chernobyl effect, the Chernobyl moment. We'll jump into that. But before going down that tunnel, um, I should note that when we arranged to do this, it was it's, it's strange. Within a few days, things can change for the worse very quickly. And I think uh, it was maybe just a day or two before Lukman Slim's assassination, we were trying to sort of set the parameters of the conversation. So the conversation has evolved into other things that we're both familiar with. So unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, sad news in Beirut at the moment, and uh, I think it's worth addressing them when appropriate. But regardless, it's still an honor and a privilege to speak with you. So, good man, Bashar al-Halabi. Let me start first with, before we get into the assassination, and it's really a fresh story, uh, the six-month marker of the port blast. And I asked other guests the same question, but I'm curious from your side. Since your article came out before the six month marker, but it's really reflecting on something that's in a way, there's something that happened and yet there's a marker that is disappointing and that not enough has happened. I'm curious from your side, did the six month marker mean anything to you? In addition to just being a marker, meaning, do you think we can now look back and say that anything positive was achieved following the blast? And I'm narrowing in on the blast and that sort of big challenge of accountability, but particularly post-blast. Is there any battle that was won regarding that issue? Is the structure crumbling the way the piece sort of articulates in the long view? Or is it really just a dark tunnel right now that we're in something that's extremely painful? It's hard to see that light at the end of the tunnel. And we're living through a very rough period, whether it's the six month marker whether it's the economic collapse, whether it's the political paralysis, everything that has gone wrong. And it's a loaded question to start with, but I'd really, I'd like to gauge your mind on the marker and your immediate reaction to that marker, what you felt when you realized that this was coming up and how it resonated with you. Thank you, uh, Roni, for all the words uh, that you've said and, and the very extensive introduction, which I will address in, uh, in pieces throughout the, uh, the podcast. But uh, to start with your um, last uh, question, 
um, especially about the marker, uh, part of me, and I'm going to be very honest, and this is not me speaking in any uh, political uh, form, it's mostly uh, a sentimental answer. So let's start with that. Um, part of me didn't want to know that uh, that day was actually the six month um, anniversary of uh, the August 4 explosion in Beirut. And the reason is very simple and straightforward. Um, the reason is because, um, unfortunately, six months later, we have uh, not only uh, Luqman, God rest his soul, but also others who uh, lost their lives, whether ones who were directly affected by the explosion or, or people who uh, might have had the ability to influence the um, investigation in any way. Um, they, they also lost, lost their lives and uh, not enough media attention has been directed to that, maybe. Um, in addition to the fact that uh, six months later, me um, having the privilege and the luxury, which I always acknowledge, and it's a very humbling feeling to look at things from uh, abroad or from a macro perspective, mm -hmm. um, th this actually um, saddens me so much seeing uh, the level of desperation, pain, anger, frustration, and all those sentiments and feelings only rise among uh, my direct friends, my direct circles of um, connections, in addition to the Lebanese people in general, only to be um, materialized, let's say, in uh, the events that took place in Tripoli at the end of January, right. over four nights, which actually, in my opinion, is simply um, a, a litmus test in addition to uh, an idea of what is actually looming in the horizon. So uh, I think to sum it up in a way, um, unfortunately, right now we are in limbo and um, six months later, um, there isn't, we cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel so far. So limbo is the word you would use to describe the situation. Let yeah. me ask you, and I, I, I mean this only in terms of maybe terminology, would paralysis also be fitting? meaning that it's there's a paralyzed situation or is that an inappropriate word to describe where we are no it, it is it is very appropriate actually and it goes hand in hand with limbo because in limbo because uh because paralysis is actually the byproduct of the political situation in the country let's put aside the economic and the social one aside but um right now what we're living is um, a complete paralysis of the uh, Lebanese sectarian system, which uh, in its most recent format or form, and I refer to the 2016 uh, presidential deal that happened between uh, Saad Hariri from one side and Michel Aoun and Gibran Basile from the other. So this, the, the last most updated version of this uh, sectarian system right now uh, is witnessing its most challenging uh, situation which has paralyzed the system in general because when we check like when we look at the news in general without having to delve into uh, com like complete political and economic um, analysis uh, of that we see that we have from one side uh, the president um, Michel Aoun his son-in-law sitting behind him calling the shots and from the other side we have Saad al-Hariri and each one is armed by a certain um, support or empowered in a way and uh, they're just playing uh, some sort of a hot potato game uh, between each other trying to point fingers at each other and accusing each other for the um, if you want the paralysis or, or the lack of uh, movement and um, the lack of any kind of mechanism uh, in the uh, Lebanese system in general, which could yield uh, a breakthrough. And that is represented basically by forming a much needed and much awaited government uh, that can actually, it's not going to lift Lebanon from despair. It's not going to save lives uh, as much as we hope it would, but it would actually uh, set a, the process in motion uh, to move the situation a bit in the country in order to be able to at least uh, sit down um, have the legitimacy and the credibility to start addressing um, the needs and the, uh, the the challenges that Lebanon is facing, in addition to the ability to be able to speak with the outside world and, and have that credibility to address the outside world or even ask for help, which is something we obviously need. 
Well, I, I like that you've, all, you've okay, so this is actually a perfect introduction to the piece you wrote in politics today, and I'm going to title it. It's the Beirut Explosion is the Chernobyl of the Lebanese sectarian system, and it sort of begins with a, with a question. Will the Beirut port explosion, in retrospect, be the Chernobyl of the ever-entrenched Lebanese sectarian system? And you, in a way, you take the long view. The article does go back to independence, so this is not really only the recent years, the post-war order. In a way, you're talking about something that's foundationally flawed. And I'm curious because I like that you've tied the system to the current paralysis. And I'm going to maybe challenge you here with, with all due respect. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Please. Would, would you put the onus, and I whether it's the limbo situation that's a byproduct of failed politics, and you eloquently just explained that dance, that is that hot potato sort of scenario, which I like that, that description. Would you put the onus there at mediocrity and mediocrity is maybe flattering this these failed politicians that have not done anything worth noting in recent years that has provided any benefit to Lebanese society or would you put the onus on the infrastructure that has in a way curtailed progress in Lebanon and people I think are maybe it, it gets very difficult to approach the issue of sub-state weaponry at the beginning, and I think it maybe sometimes it derails the conversation, but I'm asking it purely in the infrastructure itself. Is it really the sectarian model that has brought us to where we are, or is it a something that is not meant to be in this model that has made the model, which is ineffective at best, completely sort of uh, in the situation it is now, which is bordering a failed state? So I hope I'm asking it the right way, just in terms of... Emphasis. You are, yeah. Yeah, and I'd, lo yeah. I'd love your thoughts on that that issue. Well, in terms of emphasis, um, this can actually be a PhD a thesis topic <laughs> in order to... Yeah, because, for example, uh, the, the book... No, it's fine. Uh, the book I actually referred to uh, in the Politics Today article, which uh, was uh, for uh, basically a Russian historian in Harvard who tried yeah. to pinpoint or put the onus on uh, who was responsible for the uh, Chernobyl explosion. And he reached the conclusion that it was the system. And it was, was money. I love that reference. Yes. It's like cheap. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right, uh, and this was referenced in the uh, HBO series that was uh, that was brilliantly uh, mm. done. Mm. Uh, when it comes to Lebanon, and speaking of Russia, uh, and this is a if you want a, a simile that came to mind while you were speaking. Uh, at the moment, uh, I always refer to the um, situation in Lebanon and the challenges as being multi-layered. But if you want to uh, let's say, uh, use some sort of description for that, I would use a Russian doll, where you open one doll and then you find another doll inside it and you keep opening and opening it and it's almost unending and an un unending process. Uh, however, the biggest doll which encapsulates all the other dolls is mainly the main figure uh, when you want to place it, let's say, on your table and look at it, right? And this main doll this main figure is definitely the elephant in the room and the biggest player it and not a domestic player the biggest regional player that is uh, basically hezbollah who isn't only able to influence lebanese politics and dominate it but is also able to influence history whether in syria whether in yemen or even in in iraq to a certain extent so uh, the um, sectarian political system was definitely at some point deemed to stop working and to fail, especially that it was coupled, this sectarianism, Lebanese sectarianism is coupled, and this only makes sense, with the economic foundation and format and policy and economic vision of the country. So this intertwined web between sectarianism and economics was at some point meant to stop working. but. It wasn't meant to stop working in 2019. Mm. It, it could have mm. even survived even more uh, simply with the, uh, and of course, I'm not trying to advocate for that at all, but we're just <laughs> trying here to sure. analyze. Yeah. It, it could have easily survived uh, another 20 years, maybe 30 years, I don't know, by lending from outside and by injecting money into the system get, by, by giving this illusion that uh, things are working and um, 
any way um, giving or allowing the Lebanese to uh, citizens in general or the population to live the lifestyle they've lived uh, over the past 30 years since the end of uh, the civil war. However, what changed isn't a change overnight. The money didn't simply just dry up. There has been a very consistent, meticulous, uh, a very shrewd process of transformation in Lebanon over the past 15 years, which was uh, initially, uh, which initially started or launched with the attempt to assassinate uh, Marwan Ahmadi, the member of parliament at the time, reaching to uh, the assassination of uh, the late um, Luqman Islim. So uh, Lebanon has changed. If you look at Lebanon, if you want to study Lebanon in retrospect, uh, those 15 years have seen major transformations. It does not look like uh, any kind of preview or any kind of form Lebanon existed in since 1943. Uh, and it, it is a cycle where one uh, party, one constituency fully dominates the, the Lebanese scene and try to mold the country in its own image. And uh, there's always a price for that. So I, I love these. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question that relates to the later part of the piece. And it's a quote, I think it's a direct quote from uh, Gorbachev, reflecting on the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'm going to quote you to you, and Gorbachev is the one who's being quoted. So these are the complicated quotations. <laughs> so it begins with your words. On the 20th anniversary of the Chernobyl explosion, the last Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, said that, quote, the nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl even more than my launch of Perestroika, was perhaps the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union five years later. And that sort of reflection, 1986 or so, until sort of the, the ultimate collapse, even though 1989 was really the sort of the beginning of the end, let's say. But, but a five-year period where Gorbachev himself is not talking about reform or domestic sort of reform. He's talking to, he's talking about Chernobyl. And that is the backbone i think of the piece that you're that you wrote which is there is a moment where the collapse is where the where the system cannot be fixed and the system that unhealthy system the uh, the uh the the unfortunate status quo that we've been growing up with in our our lives and what lebanon has been dealt with for generations can you point at a chernobyl moment meaning meaning is it october 17 is it the port blast? Is it the string of assassinations? Is it the rapid inflation? Is it more than that? Is it is it everything at once? Or, or is it really just the expiration date of the sectarian system? Meaning that it took almost 80 years and it died, it died. And now we're sort of just waiting for that post Chernobyl moment where we can look back and say that was the end. Because I'm curious if it can be spelled out effectively. And I know you, I know your piece sort of it, it, the port blast is that big emphasis. But the reason I'm bringing this, this up right now, six months after the port blast, I know that it's still sort of you're living in it and maybe it's too fresh. But I would have expected the more visible signs of the system's failure already. And I don't see it. I see, I see the pain and suffering. I see the, the upswell of anger that has resurfaced, especially with the assassination of Lukman Slim. But um, I, I don't see that system collapsing. And I wonder if that's just, it's too soon and we're not there yet. And I know I don't mean to challenge the, the emphasis of uh, the port blast as being that tipping point, but I'd like maybe you to persuade me that we will look back and say, yes, that was our Chernobyl moment. I'm uh, I'm actually uh, extremely happy that you brought this up because uh, the moment you uh, reached out to me uh, in order to um, fix a, a date uh, and and sit for for this podcast uh, was um, possibly the first moment I take another look at at the article. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually I have this uh, bad habit of. Um, not wanting to come back to anything I write or any interview I give uh, directly uh, because uh, part of me always um, sees life uh, to be a continuous change 
every second, every minute change. And you could be, you could just finish writing a piece, go down to the street, something happens in front of you, you analyze it in a way, and then you change uh, your your perception and uh, and point of ana analysis in a way. And um, over the past 24 hours, I've been thinking about this comparison I made, and uh, I'd like to make a few things um, clear for, for myself and for you and for uh, all the listeners. Uh, when I drew this comparison, it was mostly uh, me trying to put this idea, which which wasn't uh, unique or it, it isn't my idea, anyways, uh, to to kind of compare because everyone was already talking about Chernobyl. What uh, when the uh, blast happened? What I did is try to dig a bit deeper into the repercussions of Chernobyl and what it led to and all of that. Uh, so what I did in this article is try to put the idea out there uh, just to signal any way or hope any way uh, to see uh, or to come back one day and look look back at actually the situation at uh, the timeline since August 4 and uh, on the incidents and the events that will be taking place or take takes place in Lebanon, which is a country very well known for a series or a recurrent series of unfortunate events. Yes. Uh, there's a massive difference between uh, the Lebanese sectarian system and the Soviet system that ruled basically the USSR mm -hmm. um, in, um, in history. Uh, the issue is that even for the failing Soviet Union, there was uh, a certain uh, process of accountability and justice. So uh, people were sent to court, people were uh, jailed. Uh, there was people, uh, there was an investigation, there yes. was actually uh, trials and all of that. And this attests to the fact that uh, at the end of the day, the system in itself, although it was failing, but it had the uh, state-like uh, posturing and, and a status in a way. And it was a, a very centralized state and it controlled every aspect life and it was able it helped actually this process would help you uh to put the onus on on someone and try to figure out what led to to the explosion and uh, and what have you however in lebanon when we look at things uh we don't have a state we have a collection of uh, mafias we have a militia and they're all with they all come together anyway they bring their interests put them on a table and a dominant force usually leads and allocates roles to everyone else in the room. So what I usually say about uh, the current, especially the current sectarian system in its current form, yes. uh, we have a um, anyway. So the orchestra, the maestro of the, uh, of the <laughs> orchestra, yeah. everyone else is simply a head of municipality in this massive world or in this world that they dominate and uh they try to uh basically uh give uh or run on a certain melody let's say so in lebanon six months later looking at it as well the fact that there hasn't happened any um we haven't gone to court there is no any there is no source of accountability or justice only attests to how hard how tough how entrenched the lebanese political system is and this is something i also bring up in the article and yes. i am very clear in saying that uh part of the reason why there won't be justice for the august 4 explosion at least in the short to medium term is mm -hmm. because the system is so entrenched it's so deep and it protects everyone and i give a very small comparison and a quick comparison to what's happening in contemporary times now uh, and and that uh, dealing basically of uh, the country the state mainly the government and the ministry of health with the covid situation we have a minister who miserably failed a minister who was celebrating a minister who was cutting cake dancing depke with with lebanese people and now lebanon or over the past month or so lebanon has been one of the worst hit countries in the world but did anyone actually point fingers at the minister of health and even hope to eat to say that we want to hold you accountable of course not because 
There's so many ways to actually deflect responsibility in a system like ours. And this will be, and this is a reality and the case of the um, October uh, of the, excuse me, August 4 port explosion. However, mm -hmm. the idea of, or the, um, maybe the hope to put this idea, let's say out in the world was mostly about uh looking at what you mentioned in, in your question uh trying to pinpoint or at least benchmark a moment where we can start let's say counting down uh the days and months or years possibly of the current system in a way to to give hope to to the people because obviously people in lebanon don't have like they ran out of any kind of hope but in also in a way to try and back compare and test how tough the system is and how can it actually withstand or how will it be able to withstand uh, this moment in time? Will it? Right. Will things go back to what they were on August 3rd in 2020? This is definitely not the case. And something mm -hmm. new is going to take something, new, something different, not necessarily something better is going to come out of what happened, but we entered a new phase, a new, uh, yes, a new phase, a new version, let's say, of the uh, system in place in Lebanon. And with time, we'll be able to uh, demarket in a way or highlight it in order to be able to think or see it better and see where actually lies the center of gravity and who is calling the shots. And this is in a way kind of clear. I'm going to go a little further because I, I appreciate yes. that you're able to pinpoint that there is a there is a line that was drawn between August third and August fourth. That there's no there's no no going back to pre August four. So that's clear, and that is sort of the reference point to give everyone hope. And I'm going to uh, go back to the uh, the piece. You ask questions, and I like these questions. And they're sort of in a way you're asking the audience and yourself. Why haven't any big heads rolled? Who are the perpetrators? sort of the standard question we still hear, and that it's just yes. been low-level low detainees, and it's not enough to satisfy anyone when it comes to justice. And this just clearly, it's a dismissal. So those questions are asked. And then a little further, in theory, a vector connects the massive explosion on August 4 and the, quote, Lebanese sectarian system, end quote, rendering it responsible for what went down on that day. So. That, these questions in mind and that is that assertion. Lebanon uh, not being faced with uh, regional problems. And I'm saying this vaguely and I'll get a little deeper. It's come to light that perhaps associates, friends, business partners with the Syrian regime may be involved or most likely are involved with the parking at least of that ammonium nitrate dump. So Lebanon in itself is hosting a regional problems weaponry. Is that the core issue or is it the sectarian system? That's the core issue. And I'm, I'm speaking really directly about, can we look back and say the sectarian system and the vectors that you describe and all the things that are wrong led to that situation? Or is it that Lebanon's sovereignty is non-existent and security over sensitive sites, particularly the port, but other sites too, is a free-for-all. And if it's if it's under anyone's supervision, it's the, the, remember the Russian doll, which I like that analogy, it's the largest one. Not necessarily that they are the reason why the Lebanese state has reached where it is right now, but they're a big contrib contributing factor to the reason why Lebanon has no sovereignty. And then if anything, that's where sovereignty is. It's in the, it's in the transit sites, it's in the port, it's in the airport. And I be, am I, in a way, the, these kinds of pointing at the problem, would, would it be fair to say that it's Lebanon's openness to regional conflict that led us to have a very, very, very strange storage of ammonium nitrate that had no place there? Or is it the sectarian system? And, or is it both? Is it really both? That the two are the reason why 
that Chernobyl moment happen. And it's almost like a, it's a meeting of the two things that are horrible to Lebanon. And they sort of danced appropriately when that happened. And I, it's, a, it's almost like, a, I don't want it to be too hypothetical and I'm being unfair by maybe even asserting this because I know that's not really the core issue of the article, but I respect your positions on it. And I was wondering if that's, if you would incorporate that into where we are right now, that, the, that Lebanon is absorbing every regional concern when it comes to regional security concerns. And that's why the neighborhood I live in, half the city was torn apart. So I'd love you for any 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 reflections on that. Actually, I love this question, and uh, it's it's going to allow me to say something probably for the first time um, ever. Then, all right, uh, we we are a young generation, relatively speaking. Um, we um, at least I was born towards the end of the war. I did not experience the war, mm-hmm. uh, despite uh, all the traumas that you grow up with um, as a result or as a repercussion of the civil war, especially due to the lack of any transitional justice process and holding people accountable for what they did. Despite all these traumas that you live with, your parents, family members, their friends, and what have you, we were able, we had the the chance to, um, if you want, develop in a way um, critical thinking. And I say this humbly because uh, this doesn't mean that we're always critical. We sometimes tend to <laughs> only uh, try to ensure and acknowledge our own biases and what have you. However, I say this to, to tie your question in a way, uh, to tie both options that you offer in your question in a way into one simple um, answer. I really think that this current system in its form, in its general form, no matter who dominates it, no matter who sets the tone of it, will always lack sovereignty and if we uh, mm. and will always invite conflict so mm. since the moment the country was like formed in 1943 since it gained its independence up until today lebanon has been in the midst of every regional conflict in the region first we start with uh nasser's ascend ascension right and the role he's he played and the pan-arabism then we were involved with the Palestinian cause. We were also involved in, even in the Iraqi Kuwaiti, uh, in the Iraqi right. invasion of Kuwait. Yeah. Uh, we were involved in, uh, I don't know, we were involved in the war in between Libya and Chad. We, right. Lebanon has been involved in every regional conflict simply because it's sectarian system uh, that uh, prevents a, a, a state, and I don't call for a central state, a centralized state, mm-hmm. but it prevents state institution, the building of state institutions. It prevents uh, the building of uh, a citizenship, the Lebanese citizenship. It prevents the um, basically the formation of a Lebanese uniting identity uh, because it's been built on grievances and injustices since 1943 up until today. And it is almost impossible to address those injustices and uh, grievances uh, in such a system because at any point in time, one constituency is going to feel that they're not well represented or they're not receiving what they uh, think they deserve or uh, the fact that uh, they can uh, tie themselves to any regional ascending power uh, and try to impose or leverage that onto the Lebanese political scene. And this ha- this has been done literally by every major Lebanese constituency since the formation of Lebanon up until now. So the system in itself does prevents the country from establishing any kind of sovereignty. Does that mean that uh, by simply shifting to a, a, let's say, secular republic, we'll be able to do that? I don't have the answer for that. Will will Lebanese people at some point decide that, okay, it's enough, we can't deal with this anymore, we cannot uh, be involved in every regional conflict or in neighboring uh, countries, and we need to focus on our country? I really think that uh, so far, over the past hundred years, everyone has failed to do that. Even people who speak in the name of Lebanese sovereignty and Lebanese nationalism and, and, and what they were doing were simply trying to preserve their interests in the system as it presented them with. So mm. what should be done is, I personally, I think some sort of a transition, uh, a slow transition into, into a new model. But to go back to the your main answer, um, come think of it. 
let's let's say that uh, basically the ammonium nitrate 100% were uh, tied to the Syrian regime, who basically Hezbollah is their main ally in the country, in addition to uh, President Michel Aoun and, and what have you. Why, what allows those constituencies to bring the ammonium nitrate to Lebanon? Is it simply because they, they're the dominant force? Is it simply because they, they currently run the show? Or because Lebanon in its current form always will, uh, be, Always will allow such mm. a, yeah, such breaching of Lebanese sovereignty. So and and to to if you want to argue more or further into that, we we have we have it on the record that literally everyone knew about the ammonium nitrate. It, right. Even right. Hezbollah yes. and the Syrian regime's harshest and staunchest opponents, from Saad al Hariri to Walid Jumblat, who had a, a minister at the time, to um, everyone, to the ex-president to different prime ministers. So literally everyone in the country knew about the ammonium nitrate, except the average Joe in the country, which actually ended up paying the hefty price for yes. that explosion and the repercussions of having those ammonium nitrate over there. So uh, is it simply a, a lack of sovereignty in Lebanon and the lack of Lebanese people demanding sovereignty, or is it a, a foundational problem that will continue to generate crises uh, because of the sectarian system. And I think it is mm. the latter. And this is where I try to draw the comparison with the uh, Chernobyl explosion, because uh, let's say uh, Chernobyl was run by a different system. Let's say uh, Ukraine, uh, like modern day Ukraine was running the uh, the um, nuclear reactor, would have had it, would have uh, had it explode, exploded in that way. I don't think so. And this is something that, um, and this is some uh, simply an extrapolation or a hypothesis. But in the um, studies of the explosion, and it's something also referred to in the HBO uh, series on Chernobyl, uh, the moment where the trial is taking place, when uh, one of the accused is asked, or one of the verdicts is asked, and he says, because uh, we went with the cheaper rod because this is what we're asked to do. Yes, so yeah, yeah. the system in itself is the, is the one that generated this uh, moment in time. And there is no other way, no other possible way where you could have prevented it. And in Lebanon, this is where the comparison works. This system that has continuously generated crises since the 1943, and I, I addressed that very quickly by mentioning the 1958, 75, uh, 2005, 2008, 2011, all of that, mm -hmm. uh, all these crises actually were only a buildup of what eventually led to the August 4 explosion. And unfortunately, the fact that there, the process of accountability and justice remains elusive so far means that this might not be the end of the this vicious cycle of crises that the system keeps generating and this is the genius of the lebanese um sectarian leadership in the country because they know that every 15 years something big has to happen right and every 15 years and this is i don't know if this is uh history uh treating us uh unfairly of or is, is it some <laughs> sort of um irony that that we deal with or black comedy that we live uh, we live through, but uh, what they do and um, their points of uh, like their forte mainly is to bank on any crisis that happens only to further entrench themselves and to consolidate their their interests and preserve them and maybe also try to uh, build on them um, anyway. And this is what's happening right now. I like the emphasis on the system preventing sovereignty. I don't think I've heard it said explained that way, that the system in itself assures no sovereignty. And the system has, I mean, in a way, your, your article kind of, it, 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 it does point to that. I'm going to quote you to you one more time. Uh, in fact, this system has been creating a series of sequenced crises and political turmoil, which shaped the power sharing arrangement within the different communal groups and overshadowed the, nas the nascent state. So in other words, this whole romance of the national pact and that communal power sharing, that nascent state, which I often think of in something that's not necessarily bad. You know, it's interesting. I, I look back to the 1940s and 50s, even with the complications that led to the civil war in 1958, 
even with what you described earlier, the rise of pan-Arabism and Nasser, but then you have Fu'ed Shheb, meaning him at the border. But even then, even then, I, uh, I often think back to those years as the only years the Lebanese state functioned. But what you're, what you're pointing at is something different, which is there were, never was a sovereign state, that it was just a matter of time before every crisis in the region was going to become part of Lebanon's story. And I think it's a, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way of at least leading up to the most miserable situation and the most horrific non-nuclear blast in modern history. So I, I like the long view, and I think you narrate it eloquently. Uh, Bashar, I'm not going to take more of your time. I just want to ask you one final question about the tragedy that happened two days ago, um, the assassination of Lukman Slim. I released two episodes back to back with a number of uh, people that I admire just reflecting on both the six month marker and his, his assassination. And I also shared my own words on my father's assassination in, in late 2013 and the emotions that come up from that kind of political crime. Um, I think that's almost sort of downplaying it, that, that outright murder. And I, I sense, and maybe this is a feeling you share and you could say as much as you'd like, I sense that the climate of fear, uh, legitimate or not, meaning that the way you grew up and the way I grew up, although I think, I guess I'm a bit older if you grew up at the end of the Civil War. I, I'm from the early 80s. I'm assuming you're from the late 80s, but we're the same generation, that we grew up in always being extra careful over what we said, it, primarily regarding the Syrian regime and names where the, the names Hafiz, or more importantly, Assad, where you wouldn't say them openly and you'd whisper them if you, if you needed to, or you'd just outright avoid the subject altogether. And the way we kind of grew accustomed to that, and the 15-year the 15 cycle, which I like, because I reference that myself always, that was 15 years of, that was a long 15 years of Syrian hegemony. But the climate of fear was there. It was really only towards the end that Lebanese started speaking up more and more. And then the assassination started. And the sort of challenging the infrastructure meant death. The Syrians are gone. The Syrian army is gone. The Syrian regime is not nearly as involved, let alone in Lebanon, but in Syria. But that said, today, I sense it among my peers, among sort of people I, I respect and there's a there's a there's an echo sort of there's a familiarity of uh, not to speak about what you which you called the elephant in the room earlier. Do you feel that in the near term we're entering something that was akin to the early 1990s, regardless of whether or not this is the Chernobyl moment long term, that we're now going to need to second guess what we say, who we speak with how we approach that subject? Or do you think that battle has already been won? That the last two days have shown that the Lebanese are fed up and that they're willing to speak out and they're willing to point the finger, risking themselves while doing it. And I'd like to hear it from your side because I, I, I sense it on my side that I'm, I'm willing to speak up and I maybe almost that there's a line that's been drawn and that's the security infrastructure unlike the Syrian model, which was outright fear of anything spoken against that regime, that now it's a breathing space afforded, but there's a point. And when you reach that point, you're removed, you're eliminated. Whether or not this resonates with you, or, or do you have maybe a different take? Are you more hopeful that the freedom of expression and that battle, it'll never be lost in Lebanon? And we've paid so much, so much blood for that and we'll never ever lose that battle and just your own reflections because i know it's fresh it's very recent but I'll, I'll mention this samir asir square today was alive for about two hours and i'm guessing you saw those images as well people chanting one woman in particular shouting accusations against hezbollah and that's the samir asir square that i know gathering talking about the issue openly without fear but, you know, an hour later, it's the eeriness and silence that has pervaded Beirut, not just because of COVID. And this the same walk 
that I took when I met you a year and a half ago or so, October 2019, where none of this was on I, none of this was on my mind. I'm going to guess it wasn't on your mind then, although maybe it was, that there was a sort of a joy, joyfulness on the street, that the expression was ours. And now I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. So uh, to start with, I, I don't think that we can ever say that a battle, uh, especially the battle of freedoms uh, and freedom of expression has been won in Lebanon. If there's one rule or if there's one lesson to to learn from uh the past four years in the united states of america uh is that democratic principles are a daily workout a daily exercise that you have to do in order to uphold those principles mm -hmm. um for yourself and for the community you believe in uh, or the com community you belong to and for the worldview that you believe in so, and this is what happened, uh, and this is what actually this specific idea maybe was uh, the moment of truth that resonated among a mass of American people who decided to go and vote Donald Trump out of the White House. Coming to Lebanon, and of course the comparison uh, is not there to say that those two countries um, are alike in any way. The, again, the battle for freedom of expression will never be won in Lebanon or even in the Arab world to be more specific because mm -hmm. this region, unfortunately, in the current architecture that it is in, uh, in the current uh, status with under the current authoritarian regimes that uh, preside over it, no battle for freedom, especially freedom of expression, could be won and set in stone. So from that perspective, we have to work on it every single day. On another level, I, I like the comparison that you draw between uh, the 1990s and the current uh, day Lebanon. Um, at the time, um, it, we had the Syrian regime ruling the country. Um, there was an international, if you want, um, convention or international um, and in some type of an agreement, unspoken yes. of agreement, which dictated that uh, Hafez al-Assad is allowed to run this country, the backyard of Syria, this is how he views it, um, until further notice. And it was only for the assassination of uh, ex-Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, which was a seismic uh, wave, that shock wave throughout the world, not only through Lebanon, which ended up uh, forcing the Syrian regime out of Lebanon. And if it weren't for the people of Lebanon going down to the streets, screaming in, in millions and, and millions of voices, demanding the Syrian regime to go out, this wouldn't have happened. Syria would have still been in Lebanon up until mom the moment. So it is the will of the people that always changes the situation. Now, to the assassination, to the unfortunate assassination of Luqman. Nowadays, we have basically Hezbollah, this Lebanese uh, militia that runs and dictates uh, the political and security situation in the country. The difference between Hezbollah's model uh, of dominance in Lebanon and that of Syria is that Hezbollah is actually smarter in uh, running the situation. It banks on the differences in the country. It gives the illusion or wants to enforce and empower the illusion that uh, this country is very diverse. It's a mosaic. We have different constituencies. There is a margin for freedom and people are allowed to say what they want. But what has happened since to not only since 2005 since the 80s up until today every single person who worked or every single party or even movement who tried to work against uh, or try to oppose the um, project of Hezbollah dominating Lebanon and I don't talk about it from a religious perspective I talk about it from a strictly political perspective mm -hmm. so anyone who tried to oppose this project has has been has has gone has been yani has been eliminated in a way unfortunately so what took place today in samir asir's square is is something that renders hope absolutely but it's also not enough and won't be enough until the lebanese people decide that in order to move forward in order to break this barrier of fear which the one of the main points of or one of the main messages uh, meant to be sent by the assassination of Lokman's team is to try and re-establish 
um, this barrier of fear in a situation where the country is descending at a marvelous speed into chaos uh, on an economic and social level. And of course, we have Tripoli's events only to, to remind us of that. Yeah. So this, uh, the, the, the elephant in the room that is attempting to dictate the tone and politics and the security situation in the country wants to reestablish this fear factor, wants to, allow, wants to give from a, a, a new way um, this illusion that there is certain space to like protest, to give your opinion, but at the same time, moving forward right now, what needs to be done is what they dictate to do, unfortunately. So in, in a nutshell, uh, if the different movements or different uh, parties, let's say, that emanated from the October 17 movement, they do not deci decide on coming together, on agreeing, for, yeah, agreeing on a strategy, on a blueprint for the coming days, the years, their vision of Lebanon, what they want the economic situation to be like, or the economic model and the political model and all, and all of that. If this isn't uh, done or this isn't achieved in a way, uh, we are heading into at least a decade or two of despair, of um, misery, of poverty, of I don't know, famine maybe, and all of that. Unfortunately, I wouldn't want to end the podcast on such a dark note, but uh, it all goes back to the will of the people. If the Lebanese people decide to rise up, demand their independence, sovereignty, uh, demand accountability and justice, not only for the August 4 explosion, for all the political assassinations that happened and for the biggest theft in history, that is the biggest Ponzi scheme as well in history, uh, dictated by a certain economic model that was set in place by certain politicians and uh, run or by, by the central bank, then we wouldn't, the, the situation would remain as it is. And the traumas that we lived in growing up, we will only, and we inherited from our parents, we will pass them down to the younger generation. And this vicious cycle will continue with the system re-entrenching itself, recreating itself and existing even after we are gone. So it's usually with these kinds of words of wisdom that I wrap up an episode. But you said something that I need to add one more question because you pointed at something that means some, means a lot to me. You emphasized the will of the people. And I've been combating this view that the March 14, 2005 revolution against Syria's rule over Lebanon was real. And the intimidation that the Syrian army and the Syrian Mukhabarat and the Syrian regime felt was real, that it wasn't just the Americans and the French and the Syrian regime and pressure. I believe that. I believe that. At the same time, I still believe October 17 was, was as ecstatic as euphoric. And it seems that the international concern over Lebanon is minute as best at best Macron's love affair aside that sort of the meeting Feirouz which is lovely embracing people on the streets of Beirut which is great condemning everyone several times and then sort of staying at home and canceling a trip because of COVID whatever it seems like not just the region but the entire international uh, power structure uh, would rather just skip this round when it comes to Lebanon. And I'm going to ask you whether or not you think the power of the people is enough because the aftermath of the 2005 revolution where the people were in a way lining up with strategic concerns abroad, it was short-lived. And we saw then the rapid decline and the assassinations, which we've both been talking about, which, I mean, became a regular occurrence. The 2008 event, which you pointed out earlier, the failed compromising, this 2016 sort of marriage that ended in rapid divorce and chaos. It seems increasingly to me, and I wanna know if this resonates with you, that without an international push to at least embrace the idea that Lebanon's sovereignty is a key demand, even if it's not echoed every day on the streets of Beirut, 
even if it's not what when people see their money disappearing that's not the thing that comes to mind it's 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 the hunger in a way is overwhelming you don't think about your sovereignty when you think about your wallet and your family and your your own suffering none of that but i mean i mean can the will of the people actually change things in lebanon it's not the first protest movement we're old enough now to have seen several that have led to further despair do we need to at least seek some form of whether it's an understanding or even at maybe a more dramatic gesture protection from abroad that this country cannot function without that kind of understanding because i don't know i really don't know if if this is our chernobyl moment and we look back and we see it the way you your paper describes it and the way you're emphasizing okay it's our chernobyl moment but the country ends up in a failed state where it's no longer the lebanon that we remember and i know we didn't want to end it on the bleakest term but i think in a way it's hard not to it's hard not to given how bad things are so i think it's okay this time to end it on a sort of negative note but from your side from your side do you see it that way or is it really just people power is really the key ingredient Roni, definitely people the people's will is the key ingredient but it's not the solution and it's not the final solution in the sense that it does not ensure you a brighter uh, future or it doesn't ensure you a transition into a different more uh, illustrious uh, situation what it does is that it breaks the status quo it actually breaks the, it, it achieves a certain breakthrough into the situation and the amr uh, al uh, that is on on the grounds anyway. Yeah. So the 2005 moment was not meant to, um, or, or the March 14 revolution was not meant to uh, basically um, extrapolate or shoot Lebanon into a first world country, first world <laughs> yeah. country, yes, where yeah. uh, you have, where states, uh, <laughs> the state is running and institutions are running. It was a single moment in time where Lebanese people demanded the Syrian regime goes, leaves Lebanon it, uh, with its troops as well, and to end a th almost 30 year hegemony over the country. And anyways, the factors that were present at the moment, uh, in that moment in time, weren't sufficient enough to shift Lebanon into a, a functioning modern day mm -hmm. state because mm -hmm. the leaders of that movement in time did, do not have in their arsenal what it takes to build a country because at the end of the day, they are a byproduct of this system in itself. However, nowadays, uh, October 17, uh, 2019 moment has put or yet yeah, put a process uh, like initiated, let's say a process where we have uh, new leaders emerging anyway. Mm. They're not they're not extremely uh, popular, let's say, but new ideas are emerging and new figures are emerging. People who have different kinds of grievances, who have different pains and, dis and desperation and what have you, and they have a different vision for, for this country. And they also believe in a common ground between different Lebanese people. Uh, they uh, maybe think about uh, what a Lebanese citizenship could look like and what a Lebanese uniting identity could look like. And uh, just to give an example of uh, what's happening uh, or some sort of a comparison with what's happening right now, okay? Mm -hmm. The 2011 uh, moment in the Arab world dubbed the Arab Spring, although some, many people um, attempt to uh, tarnish uh, the legacy of, of that moment in time. And it's something extremely controversial and we'll keep talking about for the next 50 years. However, the United States under Barack Obama at the time did not simply decide to throw under the bus its major and main Arab ally at the mm. time, mm. Uh, which is Hosni Mubarak, simply because Barack Obama believes in principles uh, and the principles of democracy and freedom and all mm. of that. If it weren't for millions of Egyptians going down to the streets, Barack Obama wouldn't have gone to this like press room in the White House and demanded Hosni Mubarak to step down. And you know the rest of the story. In Lebanon, specifically, right now, with a new administration that is actually trying to re-establish a form of security, political and economic architecture in the Middle East and why, by talking and engaging with the Iranian regime, which we know that its main, its, its um, 
like a cornerstone for, for regional uh, politics and regional uh, hegemony lies in Lebanon. In that specific moment in time, if Lebanese people do not understand the gravity of the situation, if they don't do not understand that, if they not doing anything about the situation and not rising up, not uh, attempting to break the status quo, we might actually be given uh, or we might actually be uh, one side of or one repercussion uh, of uh, any kind of deal that might take place between the regional powers uh, in the region. So mm -hmm. um, between the regional powers and the United States. So it, it doesn't mean that we have the ability to uh, decide exactly what we want Lebanon to look like maybe five years from now, but we can influence it in a way and we can influence uh, or pressure the world to help us uh, shape this country in the way we like it to be, instead of simply the figures that everyone has given up on. In addition to the fact that you have, I don't know, maybe half the have the world right now designates Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. So uh, there's so much luggage and and so so much baggage that this current sectarian leadership carries with it, and there's still some hope by that is basically uh, put on the shoulders of the Lebanese people who took to the streets in October 17. Can they take, can we take that to the next level? This is the major question to, to answer. If we can, then maybe we'll be able to influence the, the future of our country. And if not, maybe we'll have to preside under uh, a different kind of uh, um, tyranny and author authoritarianship until maybe the next, uh, for the next 15 years, where another crisis or a major event takes place in the country. I enjoy doing a PhD with you. <laughs> and I think I could probably <laughs> spend hours more talking about all that is Lebanon. So I really appreciate your insight, Bashar. And you know what? You, you talked about it in, in, in passing, but the, the, the new organization that needs to take hold, whether it's new parties that are emerging whether it's individuals that are breaking free from the past and want something completely new. And for all the reasons you mentioned and more, that if they don't organize effectively, it's all the more difficult to challenge the system which your piece describes in full. And I really hope if that organization happens and we're, we're hopeful on that front, I hope it's up to the challenge. Because uh, I think... I that, that the future it depends on it. And uh, I think that is where people power comes into play. And you, you sort of, you offered a measured, measured hope with emphasis that it still matters, that they will influence at, at least influence the narrative long-term. Um, I hope I can walk with you in Jamezi at some point soon. And yes, you wanted to add one more thing, please go ahead. Yes, I, I, want, to, I want to end this podcast. Um, and I want to reply to uh, the uh, introduction that you've made. Uh, that moment in time where we met in Jamezi for the first time, I actually uh, knew about Roni Shatah. I knew Roni Shat who Roni Shatah was. Uh, I've always been a fan of Roni Shatah, the idea uh, that is this person that uh, introduces uh, the, uh, that introduces Beirut mainly, our city, not only to its homegrown uh, sons and daughters, but also to the entire world. And I see in that a form of resistance to any kind of uh, tyranny and authoritarianship in the country, whether it is uh, simply from one party or whether it is from the system in general. And what you are doing, Roni, uh, by maintaining this uh, living um, history, oral history of our city, of our culture, of our identity in a way, and our uh, history, excuse me if I mentioned that, but maintaining uh, a, a dialogue and a conversation about that with people is one of the highest forms of resistance to uh, the nascent uh, power structure in Lebanon. Uh, I've always uh, asked people to join your city walk and uh, I hope that we actually uh, walk around the city one day and I get to experience it because I never had the chance to do so with you. You're very kind, Bashar. It would be an honor for me to give the tour and have you join. It would be my honor, fully. You're very kind. So I can't I can't add to that. Thank you. you. You're you're a man of many. You're a wordsmith. So thank you, sir. And I look forward to seeing you in Beirut <laughs> soon enough. Thanks again.
Thank you, Roni. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.